Hello, thank you for joining us once again. You can always get an upload of this conversation we're about to have on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then also on YouTube uh, through the name TV3 Ghana. We also have it on the same uh, social media handles for 3FM 92.7. But we're here to talk about, you know, the president and, and the, the government's much avowed concept of building 111 hospitals across the country. But we're here to speak to uh, Kobna Atabidu. He is uh, a very renowned, well-respected Ghanaian procurement expert, and to ask him some critical questions. Now, uh, Kobna, thank you for joining me. What do you make of the whole concept itself? 111 hospitals across the country. From a development point of view, that is what should happen. We must have, every university, for example, must have a teaching hospital, as long as they run a medical school. So in our national development planning, we should look at how many medical schools do we have in the country, and each one of them must have a teaching hospital. A teaching hospital means they offer tertiary services upwards. So healthcare delivery is at different levels. You have primary healthcare, you have secondary, which is referral, and you have the teaching where learning takes place. Then you have the specialized hospitals. So in our development planning, it should be such that one, every university where there's medical school must have a teaching hospital. The number two, every region must have a regional hospital. And a regional hospital becomes the tertiary level. So you can have the regional hospital also serving as a teaching hospital. Then every district must have a hospital. Before you come to the primary health care, where within the district, when it comes to various communities, you would have hospitals. The thing is this. There's no, putting, there's no point putting in place an infrastructure without accessibility. So if you put a hospital here and someone has to trek 10 kilometers, 10 miles to come to the hospital. You haven't done anything because when the person is really sick, he won't be able to trek. So bringing the hospital closer to the people is what, what should happen. That is why the concept of CHIPS compound was a fantastic idea. It means within your locality, there's at least a CHIPS, a chips compound where there is either a midwife or a medical assistant that if someone falls sick, you can quickly go there for first aid and then an assessment and then you can be referred to the next level. Then you can go to a polyclinic and then from there go to a hospital and then from there go to a specialist hospital or a tertiary hospital. So it, from a development point of view, every district in this country must have a district hospital. So there's nothing wrong. Now, we've had a number of issues being raised about procurement, uh, especially relating to the designs. Uh, what would be your take on it? What, what do you make of it in the first place? There is no exception to how procurement is done in this country. There's a law, and everybody is subject to the law. The law says that the default position is competitive bidding. If you have reason to want to do restricted tendering, it spells out the conditions under which you can apply to PPA for uh, the opportunity to use restricted tendering. If you need to do sole sourcing or single sourcing, there, is, there are conditions which specify when sole sourcing is permitted. And it also needs the approval, prior approval of PPA before it can be done. Um, from the conversations I've had so far, it doesn't seem as if we followed that process. And that is a source of concern for me as a procurement professional and a practitioner. And I obviously, I have also read the concerns of the Institute of Architecture. And I want to believe it is a general concern for all those practitioners in the built industry. Ideally, what should we have been doing or should we have done? Um, you look at a project of this magnitude and of this nature. So all projects of this nature 
or let me, let me put it this way, from a framework point of view, construction always starts with pre-contract works. Then you come to the contracting phase where the procurement happens. Then you come to post-contract where the contract is delivered. The pre-contract works is where consultants come in and they do the preparatory works and the designing and all that. The law have, makes provision for how to hire pro consultants. Section 60 or 66 thereabout. So if you hear the Institute of Architects complaining that it was given, uh, handpicked and given to uh, architect AJ. Granted, architect AJ is a world class, world acclaimed architect. It doesn't change the fact that there is an even playing field that all must be able to play. The act makes provision for a margin of preference. So if you want to give him a margin of preference by virtue is of his world acclaim, no point, no argument about it. It is legit. But to handpick him and hand it over to him, when from a procurement point of view, when we look at the category of service and the supply base, there is an abundance of suppliers for architectural works that it doesn't require sole sourcing. What they could have done was to use the normal practice of initiating a competition where architects will come and compete on the concepts. So what you do is that you give a brief of what you are looking for and invite concepts and they compete and the best concept is the one that is selected and then you go ahead and they could have easily done that to bring competition into the game and I would have loved it for architect J to have learned from the parliament issue and to tell them that I won't saw my name so if I would do this Let's compete and let them prove that they are better than me. Then you do this. Because when you do that, you invite yourself for criticism and too much scrutiny, which is unnecessary. I mean, if you look at the kind of project he does worldwide and the kind of money he's ma he makes, this is nothing to what he could potentially make. But the brand effect the effect on his brand equity, it's not worth it. And if I, if I was a uh, consultant or advisor, I would have advised him to ensure that he doesn't get into such controversy. 111 hospitals, possible in 18 months, the time span and the period that we're told that it has to be built. Don't forget that we put up a 100-bed facility in 100 days. If I say we, I was part of the team that put up the Ghana Infectious Disease Center, the COVID-19 facility at Ghana East. And it's a 100-bed hospital with state-of-the-art equipment. There wasn't any of them ordered as of the day the president did the sword cutting. We ordered all equipment after the sword cutting. They all came before 100 days for us to install and commission the place for use. You can deliver every project within the timelines required as long as you have money sitting down. Because all it takes is project planning and crashing the projects. And if the money is sitting there, it is materials plus skills plus good weather and time. Once you have the money to hire the number of people and the right skills, the reason why it can delay is sometimes you will decide that I'm going to use five people to do this work. But if you have to crash the time, you can increase the number to 10 people 
and get it done within a shorter time. And when you analyze your project and how you are delivering the project, you can choose to flex the numbers you use or the skill set you use to give you whatever you are looking for in time. So if they want to complete it in one year, it is doable. So time is not an issue. If they have chosen to make the delivery of it coincide with um, the next election cycle, it is also their right because he wants to deliver it just when the buzz is there so he can make political capital out of it. And that one, both parties do it. So it is not a problem for me. But as a project manager, it is doable within any time after 12 months. It can be delivered. When you talk of building 111 hospitals, a hospital is not the civil works. It's not the building that is sitting there. That is the reason why there was a lot of controversy about University of Ghana Medical School Hospital, where the building was put there, but what you need to put inside was not there. That is not a hospital. I started off by saying that there are certain elements to healthcare delivery. Infrastructure is one. Accessibility is another. If you put it there and people can go there, remember the secondary schools that were put in the middle of nowhere? It was not accessible, so people couldn't go and use it. So accessibility is another. The other one is people. Do we have the nurses and the doctors to fill it when it's done? Then there's the um, equipment. Do we have the equipment to fill it when it, the civil works is done? So when you are doing a project of this nature, the construction bit is only, it's a program actually. The construction bit, the delivery of the civil works and the associated works, is one project. The organizing the people from creating, from specifying the people requirements to finding the right skills, recruiting them, onboarding them, ready for using the equipment, is another HR project that by now a team should be working on. Then there is the equipment element, which would have been designed into the civil structure, which would tell them that these are the equipment we need to buy, and they should be in at this stage. Because if some of the equipment may have to come in. So when you take the radiology department, for example, those um, nuclear-based equipment are specifically designed to keep radiation in. And the equipment must come to be installed with the project going on at some point before you start. You don't finish and bring the equipment and come and chisel and break in to develop those parts. So you have to schedule the material deliveries such that each one would come when it is needed for installation as the project is going on. So all these are sub-projects under the bigger project, which is a program. And I'm expecting the Ministry of Health to, by now, be working on all these streams concurrently. Not they finish the structure sitting there, and other streams are not done. So now we are having to wait for the structures that have been put there to grow and become a, a habitation for rodents and reptiles and, and, and then misfits in society before we go and do what is needed. So we are hoping that the government will do the right thing. Often we've had a number of um, projects like these uh, sprawling across the country. Um, if we have to determine value for money, how, how do we do that based on your own expertise and, and the work you've done and observations over the period? It's 12 million for the civil works and then uh, 5 million for the equipment. So total is 70 million per unit. Um, I always say that that amount, okay, is nothing. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. When you get into the bill of quantities and you get to see the specifications, then you'll be able to tell whether the price is right or not. The classic example is if I give you a blank check 
and I asked you, what is your dream car? What response will you give me? Most likely a Range Rover, a Jaguar, a Mercedes, a Maybach. And I said, okay, I'm paying for it. So you just fill the check and you put a price to it. A Rolls Royce, $350,000. You fill in the blank check because it's not coming from your pocket. Then I take the blank check and I go and I come back. And I bring you a Kia Sorento, with all apologies to Kia. Would you accept the Kia Sorento for $350,000? Most likely not. That is the difference between price and value. Price is the number a seller puts to his product. Value is the emotional attachment the buyer puts to that item. That is why when you go to the market and they tell you that this tomato is 20 CDs, you tell the person that I'll give you 10 CDs. Because the person says it's 20 CDs, that is his price. But you put 10 CDs value to it, and that is what you are willing to pay. In the same way, if they come and tell me that it is 17 million, okay, 17 million, what goes into it? If I look into it and I find out that it is A, B, C, D, and E, then I'll tell you that no, this is not value for money. That's first one, that's first level. Just comparing quality and cost. But when you are doing real value for money analysis, it goes as a feasibility study before the project. Without this hospital, what is it costing us? How many lives are we losing? How much time does it take to access healthcare? What does it take to access healthcare? If you can quantify all of that, and then you put this one here, what difference does it make to the quality of life of that society? Then you'll be able to tell the value of what you have put there. So if you take the various interchanges that we are building, now, take a classic example of circle. Look at the amount of confluence and traffic that sat at the Kwame Nkrumah circle. And look at how that traffic has disappeared largely after the interchange. If you begin to quantify the amount of petrol that was being consumed in that traffic, to get through that small space. And the man hours that people lost, and the productivity that people lost, and you put value to it, you find out that the cost of that structure, okay, is nothing near to what we were losing when it was not there. It doesn't mean that that structure is value from a cost to value purpose, or cost and quality analysis purpose is worth that much. It is not worth that much. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You can see a structure like that, but because it is sitting in an area which is um, soggy, like a watershed, the kind of reinforcement you need to go down and give it, okay? You sink so much money below the ground than what is outside, that nobody will see that one. And so they will say, we in a town, you say, you know. It is different from when you go to a rocky or hilly place, which has a solid base, and you are putting such a mega structure on it. So all these things would influence the costs. So you can't look at it with your eyes and say, this is value for money or not. Over the last week or so, we've been doing a number of uh, exposés, visiting various um, hospitals that have been constructed, some commissioned, some others not commissioned at all. They've been completed but abandoned and not being used. Has to be a concern for the communities and indeed they tell us so. Why do we have some of these things happening? I just mentioned that when you decide to initiate a project of that nature, it is not just about completing the civil and electrical works and then services that go with it. 
it's a plethora of projects that are coming along with it. Hiring the right people, getting the right maintenance services to go with it, getting the right equipment and all the like. The reason why you would have that project sitting down is because we only thought about putting the civil structure there. And we left the rest. But it shouldn't be so. It is normally also a question of funding. So we made a promise that we would do something. So we had to do something visible. We have put the structure there. The next thing is we don't know where the money is coming for the equipment. So the structure will have to come and sit there. And we go and find the money to come and put in the equipment, which can take us another three years. The problem, if we were running Ghana as a corporate entity, this will never happen. Because for every corporate entity, and I'm a corporate animal, the business case will have to cover all these things. And you have to manage all the risks in the business case and mitigate those risks. You won't get your board to approve you to put a servo structure there when a council or Kahon, you haven't added to it. It won't fly. So why is it that in politics and in our national life, we allow that to fly? So it's a breakdown of governance. We are not doing things the right way. When you put this one down, put that one down. Because you see, when investors are putting money down for a project in the corporate world, it is coming with a business case. It is coming with cash flow projections. It is coming with um, return on investment and payback period. Who is going to put millions in a structure to come and leave it to sit down three years waiting? Because you have to buy equipment, which is the equipment will not be half the cost of the civil structure. It's a fraction of the cost of the civil structure. So why would you put the civil structure there and not put the equipment in it and not put the people in it? So all that will go with it so that we, can, we start count, as soon as the money is released and you start spending, we are counting how quickly you will deliver and when we will start getting return on investment. Because the earlier you finish construction and you start using it for cash flow to start counting, the better it is for the investor. And that is the same approach I would want to see government manage our projects. But I can tell you that many of these hospitals, if not all of them, that we've seen so far, they have the right sort of equipment, we verify that, but they're still left unused. If the structure is there and the equipment is there, then there are, don't, the missing link is now the, the staff. And if we don't have the people to place there, because don't forget, putting new people there, already the existing hospitals are understaffed. So when you put new structures there, you have to recruit people to come and fill it. Recruiting people to come and fill it is increasing the size of the public service under the Ministry of Health. And increasing, when you are adding more, it means you have to go for clearance from Ministry of Finance. Ministry of Finance is going to give you that clearance if he knows it has cash flow coming in to be able to pay the salaries. So if Ministry of Finance can't see its way forward on cash flow, he will tell you that I won't give you clearance to recruit. If you don't have clearance to recruit, how do you fill the hospitals? All these things that we've been doing, decades on, what are we losing as a country? Because we are not applying time-tested, tried and tested project management methodologies. You don't look at a project in isolation. You look at a project and its dependencies. Before you start the project, when you name the project, you need to do the stakeholder as, uh, analysis. It is that analysis that will bring in all the people who will be involved in that for it to work. When you do it and you take it within the broader context, you make provision for all of it before you start. If you don't do that, you finish this and realize that I left this one out. And you finish this and you realize I left this one out. And you, have, and you, can't, leave, you can't move without this. So now you have to wait and come and get this one done before you can move on. Can I draw the conclusion that uh, as a country Ghana, we're in trouble? Are we in trouble? Why I maintain, I say that yes, to an extent we are in trouble is because there are people who are civil and public servants who know the right thing, who are not doing the right thing because they are fearing for their jobs. That's the bottom line. Well, thank you for speaking to us, Kobna. Um, Atabidu is a renowned Ghanaian procurement expert, has had um, 
vast expertise and working life on, on various projects with various corporate institutions in country and also abroad. But it's a bigger question. And I know that the debate will continue. 111 hospitals to be built across the country, indeed a massive one. Uh, kudos to the government for this great initiative. But uh, well, I hope that we'll do what is right by the good people of our country. And uh, you can get an upload of this. We're talking TV3 Ghana on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And then also through the handles of 3FM 92.7. That'll be it for now. Thank you for watching.